Hi guys, so it's the last talk before lunch. I know how you're feeling. You're hungry, me too. But we'll go through it together. We'll survive. Okay, so let's start. Um, so my talk is called Reactive Programming Made Simple, and it's mostly about user interfaces on the client side in the browser. Um, but basically what I'm going to show you, you can apply it in regular programming as well. So I'm from Meteor. And Meteor is a company that develops an open source framework. Um, and the main purpose of Meteor is to make it really easy to build uh, modern web applications. And um, it should be easy to everyone, not only beginners, um, advanced users, like intermediate programmers. And they, it's all in JavaScript. So what is modern web applications? Um, we have an example here that comes with Meteor. And it's called to Do's app, as you know, Every JavaScript framework should have a to-do app. So this is one example built with Meteor. So we have lists. Um, it has data. I can add stuff. Um, go to is evil, right? I can add it. You can see that number here increases. I can check it off. Blah blah blah. Delete. Awesome. So actually, all the data here is synchronized to like a server in North America, in the United States. So even though it's taking half a second to connect to that server, you still don't see any latency. All the actions are immediate, because we simulate all the actions on the client side. And that's one of the features of Meteor. And because it's all persistent, um, I can open another browser window and um, perform some changes here. And you'll see them appear to, on the left side as well. And you can see that on the right side, it's much faster, because it's happening in simulation before um, the request actually goes to the server. So this is one of the examples of uh, meter applications. So modern web applications, it's a lot of things. In our view at Meteor, um, we try to encourage people to use a lot of modern patterns, such as isomorphic JavaScript, something Spike talked about, um, instant responses, um, client-side simulations, reactive UI, real-time synchronization, blah, 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 a lot of things. So there are a lot of things in Meteor that we build. It's kind of amazing. but. I don't have time to talk about all of that today, so I'm going to focus on one feature that I think will be useful to you. And if you want to learn more about Meteor, um, I thought maybe I shouldn't give you an, another introduction to it because it's already been done before by my coworker, Emily Stark, on JazzConf Asia 2013 in Manila. So you can go there and see the introduction there. I hope you'll like it. But today, um, I want to give you Something that you can use outside of Meteor, because I know you all guys have jobs. Um, probably you cannot switch to Meteor in one moment. I'm not even trying to convince you. It's OK. Um, so let's see what Meteor is. Meteor, as any big system, consists of a lot of different packages, components. And I know somebody could tell you, hey, Meteor is another monolithic thing. You cannot separate things out. That's not true. Um, this is a basic stack. Like the um, several major components, something like getting real-time data updates from database, or like giving them to the client, um, or simulations on the client side. And this one component that I want to talk about today is called Checker. Um, this is a small UI library that we use to get um, to manage the dependency flow. Like, if, imagine you have a lot of components; they all depend on each other. Um, they need to synchronize their state somehow, and you can use this library in your applications. So here's an example of like applications that you all know probably. It's Twitter. And you, as you know, when you have really complex UI, um, you get more and more components. You try to split it out on smaller and smaller parts so it's easier to manage. So you can imagine it looks something like this. I don't even know. I, I just um, made, made it up. But, um, you might think that um, it's good. We separated our concerns. We isolated each component. But in reality, components still depend on each other. So if there's a new tweet, it appears in the main feed. It can appear the number increases somewhere else. Um, if there's a picture, it will appear in the pictures component. So they really can depend on each other. So here's another example. It's a YouTube dashboard. And this is something a lot of people don't see. This is a dashboard for people who upload videos. 
Um, so you can see my most popular video is about my high school graduation. It's really cool. But this is a complex page. There's a lot of things going on. So you have type ahead search. Uh, you have a, uh, some charting library. You have a calendar view where you can select something. And let's say you want to implement something like this. And you work in a smaller company, maybe here in Singapore, maybe somewhere else. You probably don't have 200 engineers to build it overnight. So what do you do? If you're lazy like me, you will go on the internet and find a lot of libraries that can help you. I don't want to build my calendar view again. I don't have two months. Uh, maybe somebody will already build it for me, right? So that's exactly what you're going to do, probably. You will use something like typeahead.js for typeahead search. You will render your views with the app component. Um, for calendar, you will use full calendar jQuery plugin. For SVG graphs, you will use some library like d3.js. There is a data table that needs sorting and everything. I don't want to implement it. If somebody already did it for me efficiently, I will just use their code. So here, you have several components. And they're built with entirely different uh, frameworks, uh, sorry, libraries. And they're built with entirely different teams. This code doesn't have any idea how to work with each other. And yeah, like you can use something else for this line. Um, so my point is, you have all the things you need to glue together. How do you do that? And just to give you another example, here's Google Calendar. Um, in case you think, oh, you just synchronize your data model for every component, it's not true. Sometimes you depend on the state of the component. So here on the left side, you have this box where you can select some week, arbitrary range of um, days in your calendar. And that would be reflected on the right side. So it's not even like data that comes for user. Um, it's something that is stored as a state of the component. So let's say you start developing that. And you know, this thing depends on that thing. Do I show drop down only if this constraints are satisfied? You will do some graph, dependency graph like this. By the way, it's not a real graph, I just made it up. But um, the point is, it might be simple in the beginning, but more features you have in your applications, more um, different directions um, reactivity will go to, or dependencies will go to, it will be harder to manage, and maybe you don't need to. Is our job really managing dependencies? Probably not. So you may end up with something like this. It's all complicated, it goes back and forth, you manage events here, you push it there, like what's going on? So that's why we built a small library called Tracker. It's under two kilobytes when gzipped and minified, it's really small and lean. And the point is to make any code reactive. Um, you just wrap whatever code you have into one function call, it just instantly becomes reactive. And what I mean is every time some dependency changes of that function or like that block, it will just run again. So the purpose is just to, you know, glue things together. And um, here's an example, a code example. Uh, you just put your stuff into this checker auto run, and auto run means it will run again and again and again every time something changes. So here's another example. Um, let's say I have a variable called city. It's San Francisco, that's where I'm from. Um, and we print broadcasting from this city. So like, first time it will run and it will print, I'm broadcasting from San Francisco. But next time the city will change, it will immediately run again and it will print, um, I'm broadcasting from Singapore. And it will do it itself. You just change your variables however you want. Here's another example just to make the point that tracker is not um, too dumb for you. Um, let's say we have two variables. And in this outer run, um, I check the secret variable and um, if it's true, I'll say, I'm not going to tell you what the city is. If it's not true, then I, I can tell you, okay, the city is this. So Tracker looks at this code. It understands that secret is true in the beginning, so only the first block will execute. So the second block of the if statement is essentially that block. It will not run ever until secret will change. So it doesn't matter if you change city like 100 times, it will not run again because check under says, oh, it didn't change anyway. So it will print only once. And then you change the secret and it will do all the right things. So it's kind of intelligent in this case. So dependency tracking is not a new thing. And if you look at the modern UI frameworks, um, they're most, like, 
they're often implemented in the context of data bindings. So you have your data model. I want to keep it in sync with this part of the page. OK, I have my data binding. Um, and usually, it's really hard to use this mechanism of dependency tracking outside of this framework um, with other components or like code not related to UI at all. So for example, this is Angular example. And I'm not a big expert in Angular, so if you hate me for that, please, sorry. Um, I have my computed property called say hello. It just matches my first name and last name. And you'll notice here that um, all the variables are attached to this dollar sign scope. So what is dollar sign scope? It's a special thing that Angular has. And it's different from the JavaScript scope that you have in each function. And you need to remember to do that. And there's something magical about it, because what Angular does under the hood, it pulls these variables on the scope and sees if anything changed. And this is something they call dirty checking. So this is good, but it's mostly done in the context of data bindings, and it's not really useful outside of Angular. So in Ember, um, it's kind of simpler. You still use the same JavaScript scope. But what I don't like about it, you need to specify manually what are your dependencies of your function. Like, I already use first name and last name. Why do I need to tell Ember what are the exact properties I depend on? Why can't you figure it out yourself? So this is something Tracker does better. And it's really small. You can use it with different things. Here's an ex there are a couple of examples. Let's say you have a graph that you render and use D3. And every time something changes, you need to rebind your data. Or you have a full calendar. And every time you want to display a different range, you need to set this date to your calendar. Or you have Chart.js or like video player. Every time, a different API, a different thing. Like if you have n components and you need to connect them between each other, you'll do n squared um, extra coding for each of those connections. And it goes both ways. It's not only inside the component, it's also outside of it. So whenever uh, the events triggered, like, oh, I clicked on this thing, or I went to this um, date, or I, I jumped to this location, for the playback, or I paused, or I started. All of those are like extra things you need to code up, connect together with event handlers. With Checker, it's much easier. You just connect everything to Checker once, and that's it. And you can use the same code, because most of the time, the code is pretty much important. So you can just run it again and again. So let's go back to the YouTube example. Um, so I have all these components. So at this point, what I will do, I will just connect each of them to Tracker, and Tracker will make sure that all the um, reactive variables are triggering the right events to end again. So here's my demo. Um, That's a very simple page. You can, it's a forecast um, weather app. It's not really an app. It's more like a page. So here, I say it's a beautiful day. Today is Thursday or Friday. And uh, here's the forecast for the whole week, and here's a small chart. So for the purpose of this demo, I'm going to implement it with manual DOM manipulations, React.js, because why not? It's a cool library, and charting library. So it can really happen in your application as well. You can have one part that is kind of legacy code developed by some guy who left a long time ago. Also, you have another part built with React because it's a new hotness, and there's a new developer who decided just to build everything in React. And there's a charting library because, well, who knows how to build charts? I don't. So yeah. And here's the code. I don't know why my syntax highlighting does work, but I hope it's still easy to read. Um, for DOM manipulations, we just got an element assigned in the text. And we use um, current date and um, temperatures forecast. For ActJS, you just render this component. It's very simple. You just pass a new temperatures, event, uh, temperatures data. And for the charting library, it's a bit more complicated because this charting library needs extra babysitting. What changed? Why do I need to like, tell you specifically? Um, I need to go through all your data, data structures and like, set it manually. Unfortunately, that's how this library works, the ones that I picked. So sometimes you need to update it this way. So let's go to the live coding demo. Way scary. OK, so here's. Um, the basic page, and I need a console. Where did it go? <laughs> OK, sorry. Server side developer. <laughs> OK, so uh, I don't have any code here. I just have basic um, HTML markup. Um, 
so as you can see, nothing happens. And you can see the date even correct. It's not even correct. It says it's Monday, and it's clearly not. So let's do, um, let's do some DOM manipulations. I know it's awful, but well, bear with me. So I will get element by ID. Um, in this case, my ID is day for the purpose of this demo. And I will set inner text to um, current date. And we'll see if it works. OK, it displays this, because I do it in uh, manual DOM manipulations. So I'll make it a bit nicer, and I'll just extract it into a separate um, variable. And I'll choose the string from the days of the week array, just so it's easier to see. So I'll get the day, and it will say Friday. Cool. It's Friday, Friday. OK. <laughs> um, but let's change the current date. Let's go to the future. Let's set it to something in the future, in 2014, November and 21st. Nothing happened. Why? Because this code is not reactive. How do I make it reactive? Well, that's easy. I'll just wrap this code into a function declaration, and I will call checker auto run, which is just like the only API that we have here. Run this again every time it changes. So I will refresh, and I will set it to the future, and it changes to Monday. Yay, works. Um, so I have also a pre-built function that is, randomi that is randomizing the current date, and let me call that. Um, so set interval, randomly change date, and execute it very often. So yeah, it's changing all the time. Cool. So I will do the same um, with the current temperature. So the span is forecast, and um, I'll just get this temperature for my reactive array that I declared on line 30. Temperatures get date get date. OK, it says 31. So yeah, it works. Um, so now, let me do the same for other things. And I don't want to code in front of you. It's kind of embarrassing, because I can make a lot of mistakes. Let me just copy paste something from my example that I already built. So I'll do the same thing. I'll instantiate tracker auto run, and inside I'll just render the component with temperatures. And because we use the same temperatures array, um, basically it should be synchronized. Something went wrong, where are you? Did I save? Oh, did I go to the wrong place? Sorry. OK, here what I want to do. OK, here it is. A list built with React. Pretty cool. You can imagine some fancy component. Um, so now I can call a different set interval that will randomly change my values in my array. So let's imagine the data comes from the server and there's some service about weather, and it always changes its mind. It tells you, oh, actually, the temperature will be different. So let's do this. I'll call randomly update forecast and call it really often. So yeah, yay, it's really cold on Monday. Be careful. <laughs> OK, the last piece. The last piece is um, chart.js example. So here's the code I talked about before. And again, the same thing. Just wrap it into tracker auto run and make sure your function is item potent and like you correctly um, in instantiate it first and then you just update the data. So I will refresh it. Oh yeah, we have a graph. And it's 31, 30, 32, so it's all great. So let's do the same thing again. Um, let's just randomize it. It's pretty cool, huh? I even prepared some music for you. I, th I think this guy actually knows how to dance well. So yeah, um, that was my demo. So what we did, we just wrapped everything into Checker out to run. It's not really hard. So recap, Checker is a small library 
It's part of Meteor. That's how Meteor does all the front end reactivity magic. Uh, the thing is, in Meteor, we kind of hide it under the hood. So like users don't actually need to wrap everything in these function calls. So it's very intuitive just to write your code once without even you know, thinking about the activity. Um, and it's really easy to use it outside of Meteor to glue things together. And I hope when you guys go home, you can look at it. It's really short. You can actually read it. And you can learn something from it, or maybe even use it. Um, so you don't even need to get into Meteor to use it. It's useful on its own. So it's smart enough to keep you lazy and use other components and glue things together, but it's not smart enough to do all the work for you. Otherwise, you wouldn't get paid so much. So is it it? We want lunch, right? <laughs> Hungry. Yeah, it's it. Thank you, Slava. Thank you. <laughs> Fast, snappy UI development with Tracker. Questions? It, so I've been, I'm still learning Meta.js. Um, so uh, I'm just wondering, uh, is it possible to assign a string to a tracker function, and then I can turn it? Uh, so now it's auto running, right? Is it possible to turn it off sometimes, and then turn it on again? Yeah, you can turn them off, and you can turn them on again. I didn't cover that, uh, that part. But what you can do, you can do it in both ways, um, in, in two ways. So you can either save a variable for this computation, and then you can stop it later with c.stop. You can do this. Or what you can do alternatively, um, actually it will be passed as a first argument to the function, so you can stop it here inside. So both options are val oh, val cool, valid. Cool, cool. thanks. Yeah, yeah yes. sure. Cool, one more. Um, I was interested in knowing how the dependencies are being resolved <coughs> for every uh, function that you send into Autorun. Do you use like, do you convert the function to string and just parse yeah, it Yeah, I can out? talk about that. So the question is, um, how, does, how do we track dependencies? That's basically what Tracker does, right? We track dependencies whenever they change, we run the function again. Um, so the thing is, if you noticed, um, I used reactive variables and reactive arrays everywhere. So this is kind of a catch because, um, so one of the, part of the answer is, um, in the future we can use ECMAScript 5 setters and getters, but right now they're not supported in every browser. I am looking at IE. <laughs> but uh, once you can do that, you can wrap all the objects and you don't even need to use getter or setter functions and you, we can convert these um, variables for you. So what happens, um, Checker will run the code first time and um, just the way uh, they, like, the flow of the program works, uh, it can notice what variables got called. So in this case, secret will get called, but city will not get called. So Tracker understands that um, right now, if nothing changes, only secret matters. Only the first variable matters. The second variable doesn't matter at all because it wasn't even reached. Like, essentially, right now, it's a dead code. And when you change those variables, it says, oh, like, make sure you will run your digest loop next time, and you will update and propagate all the changes. And I hope that answers the question. A big round of applause Thank for Slava. Much.